Well, I guess with that, um, we welcome Gerald to go ahead and speak. And uh, I guess I'd just like to make sure everyone knows that we will be recording this and um, provided that Gerald's okay with it, uh, we'll maybe be able to share it and make it available so that people can uh, watch it later or show it off to others if they want to. So uh, with that, uh, please welcome Gerald. Welcome. I'm Gerald Fulham. I'm an accessibility enthusiast and front-end developer for Kroger, currently working as tech lead for the Kroger design system. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter at Gerald Fulham. Uh, captions are provided, as you can see, and I will also describe images that appear on screen. Uh, DIY Ally. Uh, DIY, of course, means do it yourself. Ally, written as A11Y, is just a short way of writing accessibility, where 11 represents the number of letters between A and Y. It can also be pronounced Ally, which is a nice way to think about your role as a developer for accessible web applications. So, accessibility. You can do it. What is web accessibility? Web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. More specifically, that they can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web, and that they can contribute to the web. According to the Web Accessibility Initiative, the WAI, accessibility encompasses all disabilities affecting access to the web, including auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, speech, visual disabilities. Web accessibility also benefits people without disabilities. For example, people using smartphones, smart watches, smart TVs, and other devices with small screens and different input modes. Older people with changing abilities due to aging. People with temporary disabilities, such as a broken arm or lost glasses. People with situational limitations, such as in bright sunlight or in an environment where they cannot listen to audio. For these reasons, Accessibility overlaps with other best practices, such as responsive web design, device independence, multimodal interaction, and usability. So there's a strong business case for it. Uh, is there an accessibility standard? Yes, the WCAG, uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. You'll hear people refer to this as WCAG or WCAG, and there are three levels of conformance. A, the lowest, AA, and AAA, the highest. Let's take a look at the specs. I'll walk through important aspects of how I navigate the spec when building a new component. And I've posted the link for the spec in the chat, so feel free to follow along if you like, or you can just watch the screen, and then we'll dive back into the slides. And unfortunately, I'm on a deeper level of the page than the homepage, so I'll get back to it. All right, so here's the web content accessibility guidelines. Um, it's a long list of text and it might seem intimidating at first. And to be honest, when I first encountered this, I was quite overwhelmed and didn't read through any of it. and was just like, ah, there's gotta be some other way. Uh, but I highly encourage it. Now that I've gone through and read it, uh, it's actually not that bad and not that hard to get through. Um, the introduction is all human readable paragraph type stuff that explains what it's all about. Um, and it's broken into four sections. Uh, Basically, you're gonna hear people in the accessibility space re refer to this as POUR, P-O-U-R. That's just the first letter of each section heading, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And um, you don't have to read through all of these. These are like the success criterion for each possible thing that they care about. Um, this is not the part you just you know, peruse through, you'll end up here as needed as you sort of make the discovery process as you're building and you'll, you'll find your way to these sections. And I'll show you how I get there when I'm doing this. So uh, one thing to call out though, is that um, for every success criterion, there is an understanding document. Um, if you were to click on that, it basically tells you the intent behind this success criterion, notes on, uh, you know, common pitfalls, additional information, the benefits of this. It gives you examples of the types of components or user flows that this criteria might apply to. Um, and then it goes into the techniques. Uh, we'll talk about techniques in detail here in a moment, but essentially techniques include uh, what they call sufficient techniques, which are like this list of non um, mutually 
not exclusive things that you could apply one or more of these techniques. Um, and then there's these advisory techniques, which are things that they think are like things you ought to do, right? Uh, things you should do. Take all of these into account uh, and based on your techn technology platform. Obviously, if you're not building for Silverlight, you can ignore this advisory technique for this success criterion. They also break it down into failures. Um, failures are common pitfalls and they just, they basically catalog as many like use cases as they can think of where you'd be doing it wrong if you did it this way. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's, it's quite um, detailed. And so it's worth looking at the failures. For every success criterion, there's also, huh, maybe not for this one, might be for the failures and I apologize. There's a procedure for testing the failures and this is what I wanted to look at as well. So it's common, it's good to read through the failures see if any of them apply to your use case and then check that you're not failing. Uh, this is helpful, especially if you're called into question on something by an accessibility audit or from someone just in your company who says, I don't think this is a great experience. Well, look at the failures for your component uh, based on the specific success criterion you're trying to meet and see if it applies. Um, I've been called into question on a couple things and found sometimes totally failing. Other times you find that totally passing and uh, that we're passing all success criteria. And so it's, there's really, if you read through the overview of the WCAG, a high um, level of independence that you have and empowerment. This is sort of a myth that I hope to bust with this presentation is that you have to rely on an accessibility expert, that you've got to have some special training or that you need to hire someone with special training. Um, if you read through the overview, you'll find out that they're basically saying, do your best, consult our docs, and you'll be in the clear and you'll make mistakes and you'll make it better as you go along and that's okay. Uh, but if you're gonna be a front end web developer, just like you know the HTML spec and the CSS spec and the JavaScript spec, and we're all familiar with going to MDN and looking for you know, information, you should be familiar with going to the WCAG and looking for information. But this isn't how I like to navigate the WCAG. Uh, I like to use their quick reference. Um, if you were looking at 0 0.3 of the introduction, there's a how to meet WCAG, which is basically a link to the quick reference. It's all of those four sections broken out into a filterable list. And this is really nice. So let's say I'm going to build a component. Let's say I've been, I've received a design from my designer to build a pagination component, for example. Uh, I know that a pagination is a kind of navigation. Um, so I'm going to look through this list of tags and I've become familiar with this list of tags and I know the types of things I'm looking for, right? I'm going to click on navigation. Uh, I probably care about tab order in my pa pagination component. So maybe I'm interested in seeing if there's any, uh, what criteria apply to tab order. Uh, my company, uh, Kroger, um, has a policy that says we will adhere to level AA. Uh, if I wanted, I could filter out the level AAA related criterion. Um, I don't necessarily like to do that because when it's easy to do so, I shoot for that. Uh, if, if I can't meet it because it imposes some level of difficulty, then I skip it. But I like to leave them in when I'm searching for success criterion. So now that I've filtered a bunch of stuff out and you can essentially see, these are all the things that are filtered out, things I don't need to read through that are related to navigation. Um, I'll go back to the contents and I can start perusing. Under section one, we'll see the whole bunch of stuff has been hidden. These are the three things that I should read through to see if they apply to the component I'm gonna build. Uh, I know what my design looks like, right? So let's say, for example, that this is the component I'm gonna build, pagination component. I've received the design, we've talked with the user experience uh, designer and they indicate that these are gonna be buttons. This is gonna be a list of links. The current page will be highlighted. Uh, so I know that I'm dealing with links, I'm dealing with buttons, I'm dealing with some kind of stateful indicator uh, to communicate to assistive technology what page this might be on. So I need to take all of these things into account. Um, I'll come in here and I'll start reading through these. I'll expand the sufficient techniques. Um, I can ignore anything that's not related to the technology stack I'm using, flash, PDF, et cetera. You can even come in here if you want, say, I'm not using Silverlight, flash, PDF, or SMIL, right? So now those are just gonna be gone from the list. It's easier to parse through. Um, like I said, these are, uh, you only have to really meet one of these sufficient techniques. You don't need to go and read through all of these. So what I like to do is I just start the first one and I think 
could I apply this to the thing I'm building? Could I do it easily? Does it interfere with anything else I'm trying to do? Um, if not, this is the technique that I end up using typically. So I need to make sure that there's clear information and relationships, that the information structure is you know, programmatically determinable. So using ARIA landmarks to identify regions of a page. This is a pagination component. I want uh, users of the page to be able to know about this. So let's read more about this technique for meeting this success criterion. Basically it just says, I need to use a landmark role. Um, we won't read through the whole spec, but I know from my reading uh, through this that there's different ways to apply a landmark role. And if I wanted to know more, they do link off to like the ARIA spec. We'll pause for a moment before we get into the ARIA spec. I'm gonna dive back into the slides because it is my next slide. What about ARIA? Uh, if you've done any accessibility development, you've probably are at least familiar with some ARIA attributes and perhaps the role attribute. Think ARIA labeled by role equals navigation, things like that. In fact, I was using these before I learned about WCAG because I'd been shown them by a colleague while developing forms with custom controls. You may have had a similar exposure to them. Do you know what ARIA stands for? It's not always really interesting attributes. It's accessible, rich internet applications. This is a spec created by the WAI, the same uh, initiative under the W3C that produces the WCAG. And it provides an ontology of roles, states, and properties that define accessible user interface elements. In other words, it defines attributes and patterns for adding additional semantics to your markup. These semantics are designed to allow an author to properly convey user interface behaviors and structural information to assistive technology. So let's look at the spec where we left off. For the pagination component I'm creating, a landmark role seems like a really great way to fulfill that success criterion. Uh, and I can use the role attribute that equals navigation, but I can also see that there's this related concept of an HTML nav. I've been doing this long enough and I know how to read this spec well enough that I know that when I see something like this, that means I can use the semantic HTML element, nav, instead of role equals navigation. That's because the semantic nav element has a built-in role. All assistive technology will interpret the nav element with that role. Uh, so that's how I'm gonna build my pagination component. At Kroger, we have this concept of component blueprints, and it's a way that we describe the component we're gonna be building before we actually start writing it in Vue or React or Stencil or Svelte or any other framework. Um, we just make the markup and we wanna make sure that that markup complies with accessibility requirements. So I went through and I identified all of the things that I think uh, are success criterion that we need to apply to based on my reading through of the WCAG quick reference. And you can see that we use the nav element and this does fulfill that, that criteria. I easily could have done a div with role equals attribute or role attribute equals navigation and that would have the same effect. Um, moving on from there, I think a good way to figure out patterns for developing your components is to have the ARIA authoring practices open. You'll probably end up here if you're digging through the ARIA spec because there are lots of links in the spec to sort of authoring best practices. This is just another document that the W3C uh, produces. And it's basically like a list of component examples. Um, look and see if your thing is in here. Pagination's not in here. That basically means I'm gonna have to figure it out on my own. Sometimes I'll just do a quick text search on the page. Pagination's mentioned. Uh, it's actually only mentioned once on this page and it's mentioned right here with regard to landmarks. And it's okay for the pagination control to have um, a non-unique name because pagination is the type of control that could appear on a page twice. So this is really interesting stuff. Um, it's worth reading through the authoring practices. This is a totally human readable document. Like I said with the other one, uh, read through that introductory section and then you'll find yourself at the design patterns and landmark regions um, separately later. So I have this page bookmarked and I reference it pretty frequently. Another really good resource that I just discovered recently, and I put a link in the chat, is to the Ally Style Guide. This is a lot like the blueprints we produce. They essentially uh, list some components. They even have a pagination one. And I use this as inspiration for the one we were building. And just like ours, they list out 
WCAG guidelines that apply. They don't go as in detail as I did. Uh, they only list one here, but um, that's okay. It's a, it's a really great start and they actually do comply with all of the other success criteria because I, I checked out their markup example. But essentially, you're gonna have to do the hard work of sort of reading the spec and then trying it out. So I'm gonna dive back into the slides here. Uh, first, let's clarify the spec. Uh, we looked at ARIA 1.1 and WCAG 2.1. Uh, they're both produced by the Web Accessibility Initiative, but they're two completely different specs. The WCAG really is the guidelines for what makes something accessible. ARIA is just a technology specification for adding additional semantics when regular HTML semantics don't work for what you're doing. So if you're building a custom component or custom control, uh, maybe you're using um, custom elements and those host elements that are a part of that don't have any built-in semantics, that's when ARIA comes into play. And that's exhausting. Here we see an uh, animated GIF of a man falling asleep at his desk with his hand still on the mouse as he falls backwards and out of his chair into a wall. It's no one I know. But if reading the spec seems like a chore or a barrier to getting started, there are other ways. Let's look at WebAIM. WebAIM, which stands for Web Accessibility in Mind, is a nonprofit website that provides knowledge, technical skills, tools, and organizational leadership strategies and vision that empower organizations to make their own content accessible to people with disabilities. And I love that phrase, empower to make their own content accessible. There are similar resources out there, but I value WebAIM because it, is, it was a go-to resource of empowerment for me while becoming comfortable with the specs and learning to develop for accessibility on my own. So again, please follow along in your browser if you like, and I'll just visit their website briefly. So they basically just write articles and have a blog and they've got cheat sheets and all kinds of other great stuff. So uh, they use the spec as their inspiration and they use their experience as a nonprofit org that's interested in this space to inform you. But this is where I came when I wanted to learn how to use a screen reader. Um, I wanted to learn how to use voiceover. Yeah. Uh, there's a great introduction and we'll talk about screen readers here in a minute, but this website is just full of really simple, straightforward guides on everything accessibility. So, um, I recommend going here, taking a look and, um, be on your way. But the idea that I really want to communicate is that you can do it. You don't need to wait for someone else to tell you to do it or to tell you how to do it. Um, so with that in mind, I like to think of uh, WebAIM as accessibility, the good parts, right? Here we see an image of an O'Reilly style book titled Accessibility, the Good Parts, a parody of Doug Crockford's classic JavaScript, the good parts. Um, but yeah, read the specs. Uh, don't just read the specs. Um, and don't just read guides. And don't just apply book knowledge, right? Uh, you gotta give assistive technology a try. Here we see an animated GIF of the flight of the Concords, hip hopopotamus and rhinoceros asking why and telling me be more constructive with my feedback. So you learn, uh, you know, you don't learn, I guess I should say, by just reading. Right here, we see pages from the Digest of Ohio Motor Vehicle Laws. Um, you learn by driving, right? Here we see an animated GIF of Otto, the school bus driver from The Simpsons, miserably failing his driving test as he runs over cones, cardboard cutouts of people. You know, you make mistakes. Here we see an animated GIF of a dashboard video in a car that's rolling over after making a poor maneuver. You get lucky sometimes. Here we see a car losing control in traffic and narrowly escaping collision with other cars as it skids across multiple lanes. And eventually, you drive like a boss. Here we see a young boy driving a toy power wheel car and parallel parking by drifting into the space between two cars, like a boss. Here are two reasons why you should try assistive technology for yourself. One, develop tacit knowledge. Two, develop empathy. We'll talk about both of these concepts. Tacit knowledge. As opposed to formal knowledge, codified or explicit knowledge, tacit knowledge is the kind of knowledge that is difficult to transfer to another person by means of writing it down or verbalizing it. Sophocles, the Greek tragedian, said, one must learn by doing the thing, for though you think you know it, you have no certainty 
until you try. Empathy. Empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within the other person's frame of reference, i.e. the capacity to place oneself in another's position. Harper Lee, author of To Kill a Mockingbird, said, you never really know a man until you understand things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. So what's a screen reader? A screen reader is a form of assistive technology, or AT, which may be used by people who are blind, visually impaired, illiterate, or have a learning disability. Screen readers attempt to convey what is displayed to their users in non-visual means. Using a screen reader is just one of many ways people with disabilities interact with the web, and they can be used in conjunction with other assistive technology. And we'll get a look at some of those other things later. Some popular readers include NVDA, JAWS, VoiceOver, Narrator, Zoom Text, ChromeVox, SA, and Android TalkBack. According to the latest WebAIM survey, NVDA has edged out JAWS as the most popular screen reader. JAWS usage continues to decrease as VoiceOver and Narrator usage continues to increase. I included Android TalkBack in this list because it's the most popular mobile operating system. And that's the technology for, um, that's the built-in screen reader for Android. Much like you would for browser support, you may choose to explicitly support some reader browser combinations and not others, depending on your audience and business needs. For example, Kroger supports um, JAWS with IE, and we support NVDA with Firefox, and we support VoiceOver with Safari because that's the capacity we have, and those are the most popular combinations according to the survey. But if your users are all using a specific kind of browser, um, and you know that your audience may be using assistive technology, you might have a different um, support matrix than we do. Um, pro tip, use keyboard shortcuts. Don't just tab through the page. Uh, oh, let's go back because I went all head. I think it's a, a myth that if you can tab through every element on the page, then it's accessible. Um, that's just one of many ways that screen reader users navigate, and it falls far short of due diligence for manual testing. Uh, so let's take a look at a really bad example of an accessible web page. We'll get a feel for how bad it really is with the VoiceOver and Safari, and then we'll take a look at the same web page that's been refactored. Uh, in an accessible way, so you can see the difference uh, for assistive technology. So here, the W3C provides this, uh, this experiment. It's a before and after demonstration. So I'm gonna turn on voiceover in just a moment. You'll hear it. Uh, I will try to explain what I'm doing before I do it so that you know what keys I'm pressing and what action that I'm actually going to take. Uh, but I'll show you these pages visually at first so you can see uh, what they look like. It looks like some kind of news articles um, on a page. There's some navigation over here that appear to be buttons. There are several images. We can see that there are several headings. Uh, there's clearly a nav at the top, a logo. Um, and let's take a look at the accessible version of this page. It looks almost identical, right? So same list of uh, buttons here. We see headings, images, uh, same nav. So visually, the sighted user who's using a mouse, your traditional desktop user, may not have any trouble using either one of these pages. But I'm gonna hit it with a screen reader. So I'm gonna turn on voiceover. If you're on a Mac, uh, that would be Command F5. If you're on a laptop, that would be the function key in Command F5. VoiceOver on Safari. Welcome to City Lights. Inaccessible home page window. Welcome to City Lights. Inaccessible home page web content has keyboard focus. Great. You are currently on web content. Uh, if you hit the control key at any time, VoiceOver will stop talking. So I'm going to use uh, what I call what are called the VoiceOver keys. Uh, it's really just the control and option keys together. And then those two keys uh, paired with other things um, give you control of the screen reader. So you're not just tapping, like I said. Uh, one of the first things I like to do as a user is to just get a feel for the organization and layout of the page. Uh, if I were listening, um, I would open my rotor. Uh, this is a concept on voiceover that JAWS doesn't have, but I would skim through organization of the page and just hear what's on it. So there is a visual component to it, so you can see what's happening. So I'm gonna open the rotor with uh, control option U. 
Images menu. We can see a list of images here. Three images are surfaced. And as I start to go into them, W3C logo, image, web accessibility initiative, WAI logo, image. We see that additional images appear. Uh, not sure why that happens. Maybe some content is loading dynamically, um, but those images have meaningless names. Red bullet image. Bullet image. Bullet image. 1234 image. It's great. Uh, Let's hear what this one bullet, is. Bullet, red dot with a white letter C that symbolizes a moon crescent as well as the sun. This logo is followed by a black banner that says City Lights, which is the name of this online portal. Finally, the slogan of the portal, your access to the city, follows in a turquoise green handwriting style and with this light slant across the top banner. Image. Wow. So that was highly descriptive, uh, and that might feel like it's a really great experience as a, as a developer. You might feel very proud of yourself for having developed that, but we'll get into that one later. Uh, let's take a look at some other areas of the page. Buttons menu. Single button but we can visually see that there's more than just one button. As a sighted user, I would say that there are a dozen buttons on this page, or at least four, if I'm looking over here on the left. Um, let's continue. Auto web spots, med, web spots, med, form controls menu. Form controls, there's just the pop-up button that's on the right. Headings menu. Single heading on this page, yet when I was describing the look of the page, uh, I described, or we can visually see that there are several headings. Links menu. Here are the links. And those are pretty self-explanatory, though some of them are just labeled link. 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 That's great. Uh, so as you can see, there's a lot to be desired here. Uh, I'll get out of the rotor and we'll just navigate around. I'm hit escape. escape button. Welcome to City Lights. Inaccessible home page. Web. All right. I'm just going to start tabbing through. Uh, this should take me from um, the top left down to the bottom right in order of uh, interactive elements. So that would be buttons, links, and form controls. Visited link image. Red right. dot with a white letter C. That's in the lock quick menu. Greater pop-up button. Visited oh. link. Skip to inaccessible. So we saw that the first thing I tabbed to was the City Lights uh, logo and then to the quick menu and then up to the skip to inaccessible demo page. That's called a skip link. It's supposed to take you to the content area, but we can see that um, it didn't. And I'll, let's go ahead and interact with that. Okay, I'm down in the content area. I'll tab again. Visited link image. Back on the city lights image. Quick menu. Quick menu. Greater pop up button. Visited link. Oh, and now I'm back up to skip to inaccessible demo. It just took me in a big circle. Um, I never got to any of the interactive content that's down here. I would expect to be able to access these links and these uh, navigation items, but I was unable to. Uh, let's just try going item by item instead of tabbing to interactive stuff. So I'm going to use the voiceover cursor key and uh, the right arrow. Link, image, heading level, improving, web, visited, link, over, demo start, visited, link, image, quick menu, traffic, con today, link, 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 link. Okay, so they, are current. they are read out as links when I get to them with uh, just going item by item, but I wouldn't have known that uh, had I just looked at the page organization with the rotor or tried to get to them with the tab key. Let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, accessible version of the same page. Visited 23. I'm going to open up the rotor. Links menu. Here we can see that all the links have meaningful names. Gone are the links that include just the word link or uh, the name of the file they're linking to, news.html, etc. All meaningful link names. Let's continue looking. Headings menu. Headings. Before we had one heading that this page is correctly identifying all of the headings that we can see visually on the page so that the assistive technology user gets the same experience that the visual and sighted user gets. Um, let's keep going. Form control, no items in web, yeah, form controls, controls menu. Right, there are two controls. We get the, the quick menu pop-up button and the go button. That's great. No item. Buttons skip menu. the web spots. Images menu. Images, awesome. Here we can see. The web except city lights, your access to the city. Okay. Image. Much better. Uh, we're not getting that overly verbose um, reading of that. Uh, you might have noticed during the presentation that I was describing the GIFs and other things on the slides. Uh, there is a time for when you do that, and there's a time when you don't. And when it comes to decorative images, Wednesday, the 10th of June, 2000, uh, such as this right here, there's no need to describe um, the image as, you know, red circle with gray background with turquoise script like it was doing. That's just, it's way too much detail for what this image is really meant to convey. So just putting the text as the alt uh, description is good enough. City lights your access to the city. Um, that's really the information it's trying to convey. Uh, 
However, this image over here, which previously said something like one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, you know, six image or whatever it was, just some terrible image name. Uh, this now has an appropriate alt, and so does this one. So we'll open that back up and, and take a look. Images menu. The web city light. Sunny sp free penguins playing on stage. Image. Right. So this one is describing what's happening in the image. Free penguins is a band, and they're playing on stage. Uh, let's check out the other one. Anemone snowdrop flower blooming. Image. Right. So here we see the anemone snowdrop flower, and it's blooming. So they've they've correctly described images that need to be described, and. You'll also notice that there are no images exposed to assistive technology for these three items. Wednesday, the 10th of June, 2000. Right here. And that's because these are presentation uh, only images. They're not useful uh, for the person navigating the page. If you were to click into one of these articles, this image here would have an appropriate description of what's going on. But for the purposes of uh, providing quick and easy content, it's totally legit that you can hide these uh, from assistive technology. So we can get through this page now. If I start tabbing, we'll see link. that all of, the, link. Link. all of the links are tabbable. Link, link, visited, link, killer bees. Yep. Link, link, cop, link, 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 shawty, arrow. We can even- We're currently on a link inside of a group to click. If I were at the top of the page. Demonstration improving, selected. Visited, link, link, visited, link, 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 link. We'll visited, see that. Link. Pretty much absolutely everything uh, that is interactive is able to be gotten to with the tab key, uh, which is really great. So this made a big difference, I think, as an accessibility user. And it, you know, it, it's just the sort of thing that you ought to be doing. Um, and hopefully you're feeling empowered to do so. But this is really great Zoom tool. I'm going to go ahead and escape out of it. Turn it off. F5, but voice over off. Uh, if you were curious, you can click the show annotations and it'll just walk you through all of the different, uh, all the diffs and what was applied. Um, it's worth taking a look at in your own time. All right, so, you know, I lost my notes. During the demo uh, of the poorly, you know, accessible web page, we saw a little bit of this. Right, this is a, a picture of an unfortunately placed restroom sign. It has braille, but it's placed high above the door, almost out of reach, and likely undiscoverable by someone with uh, vision or mobility or height impairment. Uh, and we saw a little bit of this, right? We see an unusually organized grid of elevator buttons with braille next to, but not on, each button. And does this indicate the button to the right or the left of the braille? I guess I'll press both. Um, we saw a little bit of this, right? Here we see a wheelchair accessible ramp leading up alongside a stairway, but it stops short about three steps from the top. It's a thought that counts, right? Kind of like the, uh, the tabbable links that just took us in a circle between the skip to content button and, and back up to the skip to content button. Um, we also saw a little bit of this, right? Here we see a, a supposedly handicapped accessible bathroom stall, wherein the handrail and toilet paper roll have been affixed to the wrong side of the stall, so far from the toilet as to render them unusable but the handrail's at regulation height and can support up to 300 pounds, right? Think of that overly verbose image that just didn't need to be, uh, and it was actually a hindrance. These are the sorts of things that, you know, in real life we would scoff at, but yet we build them into our web applications, right? What we really want to aim for is something like this. Uh, here we see an animated GIF depicting a woman in a wheelchair approaching an escalator. Her assistant has briefly stopped the escalator and with some quick reconfiguration flattens out three of the steps into a platform. She then wheels the chair onto the platform, restarts the escalator, which carries up the chair occupant along with her assistant. And talk about responsive design. Like this is what we should really be striving for when you're developing your web applications. Bonus, check out this sweet braille display. Uh, Freedom Scientific, the makers of JAWS, uh, make this little braille display that connects to mobile devices and conveys text on the screen to a physical braille output. This is a form of assistive technology like a screen reader and it has additional physical controls for navigating content on the device. Or this tactile screen protector. Here we can see an iPhone with a special screen protector that has raised bumps in strategic locations to help guide the finger on the screen of the keyboard, uh, on the on-screen keyboard and other common points of interaction. Uh, and here is a picture of a friend of mine uh, who is blind using his iPhone with the tactile screen protector in conjunction with voiceover for iOS and a full-size version of the Freedom Scientific Braille display. Um, you know, the, the real um, 
purpose of today, hopefully, is to encourage you to be empathetic. Uh, at Kroger, we've got a saying, feed the human spirit. Uh, and I think developing for accessibility is a really good way to do that. Uh, hopefully, I've introduced you to some really great concepts. Uh, I put links into the chat for you to explore further. And with remaining time, I can take questions. In case anyone's attempting to ask, uh, you all are muted, so you'll have to unmute in order to ask. Hey, uh, I had a question. So um, I was curious about, like, uh, I know that there are a couple routers out in, like, the React space, and uh, Reach Router um, touts itself as kind of like an accessibility first um, React router. Uh, and I was wondering kind of like what what um, what does that provide and is there some non out of the box functionality that I should be looking for when it comes to like a React app? Right, so a good router uh, should simulate um, a page change. Uh, if something um, just updates on screen, like a small area of content, you'd want to be using like an ARIA live region for that and have that appropriately marked up. So if your router doesn't simulate a complete, you know, page change with something new added to history, then uh, it's not doing a good job with accessibility. You'd want your, you know, forward and back buttons to still work, um, that sort of thing. So I don't know about reach router, but I, uh, I would look for those things in a, an accessibility forward router. Okay. Thank you. And it was called Reach, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So it was made by um, one of the creators of, uh, of React Router um, cool. with a focus on accessibility. Yeah, I'll have to take a look at that. Thanks, David. Any other questions? I can yeah, sit here awkwardly for the next 13 minutes. Oh, great. Someone's about to ask a question. Go for it. No problem. Yeah, yeah, I'll fill in. Uh, are there any particular people you like to follow for, for like, I don't know, for advice or trends or, or emergent technology in this space? Yes. I follow Anthony Isaacs. Actually, uh, that's a joke and not a joke. Um, so I work with Anthony, and uh, you introduced me to Hayden Pickering. Um, and Hayden has done lots of work in what uh, is coined inclusive components. Uh, and that's really um, been a great resource uh, for me. So I, I have looked that up and I didn't include it in the links. But if you were to uh, do a search for Hayden Pickering or inclusive components, you'd probably find the, the web references for those. Um, I also, I follow a guy I used to work with. His name is Michael Goddard. Uh, I, you know, he's on LinkedIn. He's not anyone famous, but he's the guy who introduced me to accessibility and he now works for Level Access, which is an accessibility company. Um, so they're not famous, you know, he's not famous, but he's, he's super inspiring to me. Uh, and that's why I follow him. But like I said, WebAIM is my go-to uh, easy cheat sheet. And then I, I dive into the spec and try to make myself familiar with it uh, as much as I possibly can and not rely on others. But good question. Uh, anyone else? There's one thing that I just thought of that I forgot to mention um, that I had uh, told myself I'd make a mental note to share in the presentation. Uh, I will stop showing my slide for a second and talk briefly about that. Um, earlier, when I was going through the WCAG uh, Quick Ref, uh, we were looking at section one uh, for things that are related to navigation, right? I don't know if that's still all filtered. It's not. Oh, it is. Um, I think it's 
dot three, right? You see the other ones are grayed out here. But as I was going through and building my pagination component, I read through this. I picked a technique I was going to use, right? I read through meaningful sequence. I identified the technique that I was going to use. Uh, and then I read through sensory characteristics. There's only one technique. And I was just like, what? This doesn't seem to apply to my pagination component at all. Uh, I, I read through the understanding doc um, and it seemed very unclear what it was all about. And I was just like, I felt completely useless. Uh, I did a Google search and there was no good information, but I did find the GitHub issues page for the WCAG. So I use this and I keep it bookmarked now. So uh, I think I still have it open or maybe I do not. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the WCAG, um, is hosted on GitHub under the W3C project. And they've got an issues board. Uh, as a developer, you've probably found yourself looking at, I don't know, React's uh, issue board or, um, I don't know, Svelte or anyone else that you're following or you're using their tech. You probably end up on their issues. I know I'm in the Webpack config issue board all the time. Uh, so I just was like, you know what? What's going on in here with, relate, with regard to 1.3.3? Maybe there's um, something to be had. And certainly there was ambiguity and understanding for 1.3.3. I was like, yes, uh, I clicked on it. I read through it. This guy basically lays out exactly how I was feeling. Uh, and he went to great lengths to read through all the other uh, specs that he felt applied to the component he was building and how he felt this one didn't apply, but he wasn't sure. And he suggests some language changes and he asks the experts basically, Am I right? Is it confusing or is it intentionally confusing? Maybe I'm misunderstanding it. Uh, and there's a whole conversation that happens and I read through it. And what I discovered at the end was even the experts agreed with him that yes, this part of the spec is very confusing. Yes, we can do something. Some of your suggested changes would be good. Can you please submit you know, a merge request? And I felt after reading this that I understood more about 1.3.3 than I could get from the specification itself. I came away with the confidence that I did not need to include it in my blueprint. So you'll see that I've got 131, 132, and I excluded 133 from my component blueprint for pagination, uh, all because I took the step of going to their issue board and looking to see. So that's the sort of thing that you can do also. Um, I, there, I think there's a real uh, apprehension on the part of developers or designers to like go against the spec for legal reasons. You're not going to be sued if you are trying. Um, that, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I can't guarantee that. But uh, what I'm trying to get at is you can make these decisions. And in fact, like I said, if you read through the overview uh, paragraphs in the WCAG, they basically say the same thing. Try your best. Um, one other thing that's really important to call out is that they use a lot of language like... Um, must, should, may, uh, right, um, right. These are, um, these have meaning behind them. When you see things like must, that is a requirement. When you see things like may, that means it's optional. And sometimes you'll th see things like should, and that means we think it's a really good idea. It's advisory. But if you have a good use case, you don't have to do it. Uh, they leave a lot of room for flexibility and you should feel empowered to make your own decisions as you go and build your components. Test it out in a screen reader or other assistive technology and feel empowered to make decisions. Uh, so, Thank you for that uh, last tangent. Hopefully that was a, an extra beneficial piece of information because I, I, I did want to include it. Uh, any last parting questions from anyone? Five minutes left. Awesome. Well, uh, Gerald, thanks uh, again for talking today. Um, thanks everyone for coming to listen. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants to hang out for a little bit and uh, talk at all, we can for a little bit. Um, I'm sure that other people that a decent amount of you have, you know, work to go and get back to, but yeah, I'll stick around for a little bit.